popcorn. But like in all good stories, there's an unexpected twist. 2020 hits and bam, the new normal, with stages going dark all over the world. Uh, oh, thank, thank you. Now, it doesn't take a PhD in accounting to know no lights, no camera, no cash. Which means we need a little help from our friends to keep on keeping on. So if you can donate a little or a lot, it sure would help us keep the lights on, making you one of the heroes of this story. Stay tuned for the next chapter in the Westdale. Okay, welcome to Hamilton Originals, people. Good to have you here. And as you can see, we've got our honored guest, Boris Broad, here tonight. Hi, Boris. Hi, Mike. How are you? Excellent, and it's so nice to have you here. Very nice to be here. What a what? beautiful job they've done of this theater. It's the oh. first time I've actually been since the renovation. And this lovely stage, we should, we should do some chamber music here. It would be great to do some concerts here. I think so. When so, we're able to have an audience. Yeah, as you folks know, watching from home, we have no audience here. We've just got the crew. So it's a little lonely, but, uh, but we're getting by. I just wanted to mention this is the start of our fall season, kicking it off with Hamilton's greatest musician, I believe, Boris Brat. It was kind of a switch from our summer season. We ended with red-green, so it kind of went from one extreme to the other, all of a well, sudden. Well, he's my neighbor. He is? Yes. Oh, well. Yeah. Our backyards touch. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Steve, what a great guy. I don't guy. know him, actually, but oh, yeah. I know of him, of course. Of course, yeah. What a, what a guy. So I just wanted to get into talking with you, uh, Boris, about your life. Uh, you've had quite the life, i got to say. I'm super impressed. I'm going to start right at the beginning for you folks, because I've done a lot of research on Boris in the last few weeks, and this guy is amazing. i got to say, he's like totally amazing. So starting out as a young boy, uh, we've got a picture I want to show you. I think we've got a picture, do we, Mark? Of um, This is Boris uh, playing at age five. That's correct. And, and that's my father off to the... You can see half of him on, on the left-hand side of that photograph. Oh, yeah. My father was concertmaster of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, and it was with the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, and an icon of music in the province of Quebec, Wilfred Pelletier, um, who started this Young Persons series, and he really gave me my start both as a violinist and later on as a conductor. You mean he gave you your start when you were five? Yes. That, that, that early. <laughs> now, i got to ask you, too. So to play at five years old, you must have been learning violin for a year or two before that. The truth is I don't actually remember not playing the violin. Oh. <laughs> it probably I was, you know, it was sort of put under my chin at the age of, of maybe three. Uh, I, I can't, I really, I, I have very few, very sort of sketchy memories of all of that, yeah. as one would in, a, yeah. in the case of being a child. I do remember, though, we all lived, my parents and I lived in, in one room, in my grandparents' fourth floor walk up on Maplewood Avenue in Montreal, wow. right in front of l'Université de Montréal. And uh, my parents practiced. Uh, my mother played the cello, my father the violin. My father wrote his music, the McGill String Quartet, which brought my parents together. That's an interesting story oh, yeah. in and of itself. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of music in that house. Uh, constantly in that room, and I was sort of in a, in a crib in the corner, and I guess <laughs> I kind of, you know, it was, it was preordained. I did try to escape a couple of oh. times, but not successfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I got to say, the violin has got to be one of the hardest instruments to learn, because there's no frets. It's not like a guitar or a keyboard where you hit the note and it's in tune. It's difficult to start. It's very challenging for, for children to start. Oh. And uh, that, that's why programs like the Suzuki program is such a marvelous program because parent and child go together and it takes children much less time than the parents to learn. Oh, so yeah. the children are way <laughs> ahead of the parents. And, and so it's also a social thing. Part of the th fact of learning the violin is that it's often very lonely and oh. that you spend a lot of time practicing on your own. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things that drew me away from... Uh, violin playing and toward conducting because oh. I love people. I like working with people and all that time social interchange, which happens as a conductor, and that doesn't happen very much as a violinist who you know goes from city to city playing with various orchestras or in chamber ensembles. Sure. If you're lucky, if you're successful, 
yeah, and yeah, yeah. Th- that that luck is is double sided. Well, and that sociability, I guess, um, by the time you're about twelve, you were starting to learn how to conduct. Is that right? Well, I- it all started really uh, not so much learning, studying, conducting. I was studying music, and and I. I, I had the good fortune of working in a way in an atmosphere at school where I was able to both s- combine my studies and my and my schooling. And my high school years, I attended McGill University as a music student as well as going to high school. Oh yeah. So I attended high school in the mornings and went in the in the afternoon and evenings to McGill wow. and studied with my father as well. Uh, but it all it all started with a conductor of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, Igor Markevich, um, who came and spent a weekend with us in Laurentians, and he would spend a lot of time with my dad because um, conductors often, along with a principal violin, will mark Boeings. It's oh, a big okay. thing to kind of get all the Boeings to work out together. And right. they spent a lot of time doing that, and he knew me as a, a young violinist, and we went for a walk, and I expressed to him the fact that I was kind of lonely and practicing all that much and... and long to do something else, but I wasn't sure what that was. And he said, well, you know, you seem to me loquacious and the kind of personality who would make a good conductor. <laughs> anyway, that was the end of the subject. Got to dinner, and he announced to my parents that I was going to come and study conducting with him in Mexico, <laughs> of all places. I was 12. <laughs> and 12. my parents my parents said, there's no way we're not sending our child to Mexico at the age of 12. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Markovich was persistent, and he hired my mother as manager of his conducting course and so as a consequence i came along for the ride ah. and then i spent the next year actually living in mexico with a family the tapia colman who was actually a real estate mogul and violinist and composer uh, he developed the town of acapulco put the airport into into acapulco and oh. and developed the princess hotel which was the first hotel in Acapulco. Huh. But in those days, of course, the only way to get there was over the mountains through Tasco. So it was quite a, a lengthy and dangerous drive to go wow. there. Anyway, but I spent I spent that year living with him and studying at Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. And so it was that was really how it started. Yeah, and now you've also you must have had a great interest in having other kids get into this, not just conducting, but orca- orchestral music, because uh, by the time you're 15, I think you had started the... Uh, Montreal the youth, Youth Orchestra. Montreal yeah. Youth Orchestra. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it, it was... I have to confess it was very selfish, because, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I needed an instrument to practice on. You know, like oh. you have a violin to practice on, or a cello, or a viola, or a trumpet, or a guitar, whatever. Uh, but an orchestra, a conductor needs a, an orchestra to yeah. practice with. And so I was already in the conducting a school band at, at high, West Hill High School. We had a wonderful uh, teacher by the name of Archie Etienne, and he recognized a gift in me, and he said, why don't you take charge of the intermediate band? So I already had that as a vehicle, and I thought, well, I need some strings. So I convinced some of my colleagues that I should uh, um, to, should start this orchestra. And then again, serendipitous, I, I was... Uh, I went to Ottawa to try and get funding for this orchestra because, of course, you need money in order to start anything. And uh, I had a sense of, of of how to travel even in those days that, you know, you met people in first class that you didn't meet when you traveled in coach. Okay. So I bought a first class ticket. I mean, <laughs> I was at the age of 13 or 14 um, to travel to Ottawa to make my presentation. And my s- seatmate turned out to be Jeff Sterling. And Jeff Sterling is a... Uh, an icon in the field of radio in Canada. I started uh, uh, stations in, in Newfoundland and in Montreal, a station called CKGM. And I told him about my project. And he said, well, come and see me in Montreal and see what we can do. And he became the sponsor of the orchestra. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite the story, quite the development. And then by the time you're in your early 20s, somehow you connected with the New York uh, Philharmonic. Well, it was uh, really not a connection so much. I was conductor of... I had my own orchestra in, in England, in the north of England, okay. in Newcastle on Tyne. And my mother came to visit me, and I, I had everything organized in a most wonderful way. I had... Uh, the, the city uh, loaned me this property called Wylam Hall. 
uh, which was the seat of the county of Northumberland, and uh, it had a, a riding stables attached to it. So I organized my life, learned how to ride, and uh, organized all my rehearsals around my riding schedule. My mother <laughs> came into this, and she thought, "This is ridiculous for a kid who's you know 22 years old. You, this is no way to live. You know, you have a lot more to learn." So. Without telling me, she entered me into the Dimitri Metropolis Conductors' Competition. And anyway, I then got a, a notification that I was to appear at Carnegie Hall to be one of 80 contestants and uh, conduct the Orchestra of the Americas in the following repertoire. Um, anyway, of course, I had these concerts in England that I had to move around. Anyway... I was fortunate in that I won the competition. I won the gold medal and the first prize. And part of that prize was to be Leonard Bernstein's assistant at the New York Philharmonic. Uh, there was no job really there. That I was see. the interesting part of it. It was the idea of, of being with Bernstein. But basically, out, other than serving coffee, there was very little for me to do. I had to be responsible for knowing all the repertoire in case somebody got sick. Oh, yeah. Well, Lenny never got sick. Yeah. And he had terrible back problems and he would arrive with crutches and so on but <laughs> he had to sit down to conduct but I never had a chance uh, and so I guess after about three months of this I went to him and I said you know maestro I really I really would like to study with you because there's nothing here for me to do there's no real job here but the best that I could do the most wonderful opportunity for me was really to, would be to study with you and um, he agreed and nice. uh, it was it worked out really well my, my chutzpah paid off <laughs> <laughs> yeah you must have a That's lot a of picture of, of Lenny and me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I say Lenny. You know, everybody called him Lenny. I was brought up to call people Mr. or Maestro and so on. It, it took me a long time to, to get around to the idea of calling somebody by their first name. Now, of course, everybody does, but in those days, you didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, now, right around that age, uh, I think a woman named Ardith came into your life, no? Like in your mid Yes. Well, Ardith came into my life, again, quite serendipitously. That's her on my right arm in yep. front of this huge truck. We did a poster <laughs> here. Herman Turkstra came up with this idea of, of doing a poster. I guess it was sort of current in those days, in the 60s. And uh, uh, it was a poster called Music Power. Anyway, Ardith was a, a schoolgirl. Um, at that time, and in fact, my friendship with her, well, my knowledge of her more than friendship at that point, uh, Betty Webster, her mother, was the executive director of the Hamilton Philharmonic, uh -huh. and I came up from New York to do some programs, and uh, Betty came along with Ardith, and I think Ardith, it was around Valentine's Day, and I don't know, Ardith had broken up with a boyfriend, whatever, <laughs> nice. and she was there with the, uh, her school uniform, uh, Mount Mary uh, Academy oh, for Girls. Mount Mary, I, yes. I know it well. <laughs> anyway, and I mean, she was, I was 24 and she was 17 or 16 or something. Ooh. And I mean, that's, you know, it's like worlds apart at that, at that age. Certainly yeah. not a romantic interest by any means. Um, but that's when we first met. And sort of things evolved because I would come here. I was living in New York and I would commute between New York and, and Hamilton and uh, I'd end up at the Webster's. Oh, yeah. And the Webster's had a, 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 a house. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Glenn, K Glenn Cairn, Glenn, Glenn something or other. Yeah. Anyway, in Dundas. And, and uh, so I ended up, Ardith had three brothers, and we would uh, amuse ourselves and play chess and uh, play ping pong. Oh, yeah. And Ardith was there. Yeah. And so, you know, I got to know her more and more, and th one thing led to another, and uh, seven years later, we were married. And they've been married ever since. Yeah, 44 that, years. That's just this wonderful. Year, this year, this August. That's wonderful. It's you, been great, let me tell you. It's been a... You know, I think a decision to marry is, I think, uh, one of those things that often happens serendipitously. It's not something that you necessarily plan. But I was very lucky. I met a person who really... Uh, with whom I, I've got along very well, and we've, we've had a wonderful life together. And you must get along because you also are in business together, really, right? Sort of, if sort you can of. call music a business. It's an, well. really a kind of, it's an avocation. Ardith is the executive director of uh, broad festivals and the National Academy and broad, orchestra, broad opera and so on. And uh, we started this uh, festival just around the time before I left the Philharmonic, I was music director of the Philharmonic for 23 years, and um, there was nothing going on here. 
And Bob Morrow, who was the mayor of the city, nothing going on in the summers. Okay. And Bob had this idea, and he said, you know, I'd like there are some important visitors to the city, and perhaps over these two weekends you'd provide something musical, because the Philharmonic is not working at that time. And so we started off, and I think it's 1986, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure. But uh, we started off with these two weekends, and then it grew like crazy. Uh, we came up with the idea of the National Academy Orchestra, which is a transition program for young professionals, people who've graduated of music schools all over the world who happen to be Canadian. And one of the problems for musicians is finding a job and <laughs> keeping a job and, and having those skills and being music director of a number of Canadian orchestras at that time, CBC Winnipeg and, and uh, Symphony Nova Scotia, as well as the Hamilton Philharmonic, I was aware that often the jobs went to Americans, not oh, to Canadians. Really? And a lot had to do with the lack of training, the transitional training. And so we thought, why not develop a school, a, a program, a summer program initially that that would tackle those elements. And now it's 33 years since the beginning of that, and, and we have literally thousands of musicians who have important careers in orchestras all over the world who've been part of our program. The National Academy Orchestra. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another great story. Um, I just want to backtrack a bit, though. Okay, too. I'm that, sorry, yeah, no, I'm no, talking that's, too much. That's great, but <laughs> I just wanted to say that it was uh, 1969, I think, when you took over the HPO? That's correct. Um, and... Just to toot my own horn for a sec, we worked on a project in 1969. Oh, I remember it. Yes, at Ancaster High School. Um, and uh, it was a comparison of some of the scenes of Romeo and Juliet with West Side Story, because they were basically the same story. So, Absolutely. So we did some of those scenes. I was Romeo. Star-crossed lovers. That Star -crossed was the whole idea lovers. of it. Yes. And um, I actually... You haven't changed a bit, I must tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you didn't have all those shrubbery around. Well, okay. Not that That's long hair, COVID I don't remember. Thing, but, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I, that was quite an inspiring time for me. Um, I remember it well. So I wish we could have had the footage for you tonight. We tried getting well, CHCH it. CHCH broadcast that concert. Yes. They, they used to do so much. You know, Ken Sobel, when he conceived of CHCH, conceived of it in, a, in such a broad spectrum and a, an important cultural Community. as well as commercial entity yeah. in the city. And they did. we did amazing things. We actually we brought a series of concerts here to the city in pop music called The Palace. Uh, with Jack Jones, I don't know whether you remember that. And we brought all of Hollywood here to to play at at the at Hamilton Place, uh, backed by an orchestra which I conducted, nice. and it, it was uh, it was really wonderful, uh, yeah. super. Yeah, Wendell Wilkes was the producer. I I he was he got in touch with me and said he wanted had this idea and he was going to do it in Toronto. And I said, well, why why would you do it in Toronto? Uh, <laughs> you know, we have this gorgeous theater here. And he said, you have a theater in Hamilton? I said, yes. Anyway, so he came, we brought him down to Hamilton, and he was totally blown away by Hamilton Place. And uh, so we started the, largely through his, his company. Um, and we had full audiences. And these were live programs done, and it was called The Palace. Oh, yeah. And we did three, th three series of 13 programs. It was Whoa. quite amazing. Huh. Yeah. Had well, everybody and his uncle here, and yeah, yeah, that's they would, great. They would live at the Royal York Hotel, and there would be limousines oh, to to Hamilton, Hamilton. To, <laughs> to to do the shows. Ah, oh, neat. Now, also uh, in around that time, um, you started combining the orchestra with pop music because I remember one of the first concerts was with my friend's band, uh, Tranquility Bass. Yes, indeed. That was maybe. Was oh that, my goodness! Look at them. Look at them! Oh, wow. So. Oddly enough, that's Ian Thomas. Um, that's right. It, it, on the left there. We got Bob Doidge in the top right corner, Nora Hutchinson. That's correct. How do you remember all these names? Well, I, Good I, for you. Uh, Ian, uh, I forget his... Uh, but at any rate, uh, I, uh, Ian Thomas is on next week, just so you folks can keep that in mind. Ian will be with us uh, playing some songs, and I'm going to make him talk about his two novels because he's written two great novels. Good for him. And Bob Deutsch, uh, I played with him since we were in grade seven. Uh, well, Hamilton, you know, has, has, has spawned such musical and comedic greatness. Uh, together, you know, yeah. Gene Levy and Marty Short and, yeah. 
and uh, amazing, amazing talents. Uh, Ian was part of Artith's group of friends, um, and that's how I met Ian initially. Oh, yeah. Uh, because of his relationship with uh, Artith's brothers. Um, uh, and they lived down the road. Uh, right, you know, in Dundas. Governor's yeah. Road. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in any case, I, we started the Philharmonic with a very different approach. Rather than hiring individual musicians, we hired groups. So the Czech String Quartet was the first ensemble that we hired. Oh, yeah. And they had escaped uh, the, the, the Prague, the, uh, Prague uh, yeah. riots and the, the difficulties in, in Czechoslovakia and went to New Zealand. And Maridi Anders, who was an agent in San Francisco, knew that I had this idea and got in touch with me and said, look, I have a fabulous string quartet. They don't know what to do. Would you hire them? And so they arrived in August expecting, of course, Canadian cold winter. So they had arrived with these <laughs> fur hats and fur coats down to their yeah. <laughs> ankles. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do, being a young person and recognizing the importance of rock music to young people... I thought that it would be really cool uh, to have a rock group as one of the the resident ensembles of the orchestra and to commission uh, compositions to be written, orchestrated uh, of the songs that they were producing. Uh, uh, this was not unusual in those days. I mean, I remember the Edmonton Symphony did a series with, um, I'm trying to remember the... Uh, the name of the rock group, but it doesn't immediately come to mind. Uh, but but there was a lot of crossover during that time, and I thought Hamilton should be a center for that. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that started. And it really grew. We're going to get into that in a and few minutes. And it continued so. even to this last couple of years, where the Arkells, for the example, Arkells. their very first appearance on the Junos, we backed them up. Yep, yep. Uh, we almost have had that clip, but we have a picture of it at any rate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a great thing that you did, combining rock and, and classical and pop. Um, I guess there was other similar ones like Boston Pops, wasn't there? And well, the Boston Bernstein... Pops Boston Pops was more more classically oriented than okay. than the combination then, of rock, rock and yeah. Um, but uh, there were certainly examples of it. Uh, the I, the idea of it, I I really believe that there is no such thing as as uh, bad, uh, they're, they're, that that because it's popular it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation for me. Mm -hmm. I think there there's good music and and yeah. less lesser music, less, and, yeah. and that's true of music in all its forms. And that's so I like to I like to combine uh, musics of different sorts. It's also interesting. Yeah, I mean the Arkells. I could have kind of predicted that they would have that kind of success, success because they were so well organized, and oh, yeah. everything they played was all well thought out. And rehearsing with them was a real joy. They really knew what they were doing musically. Nice. Well, I hope. And they get... also wrote melodies. Very few rock groups today write melodies. Yeah, they just kind of wing it's it. Sort of and... sound effects, musical sound effects with words. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but not, but not melodic. Not, not having a melody, which of course the Beatles were were famous for. Yeah, and other great writers, good for melodies. Um, yeah, so I Queen, guess so on. So, so, yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say, I guess ever since you were a kid, you realized this youth, this combination of old and young and youth and and. Experience. Well, my teachers were all very much. Uh, encouraging of the idea of, of of young people, and they they adopted me as a student. I was very very young when I started conducting. I Pierre Monteux was eighty five and took me on as an assistant when I was seventeen years old with the <laughs> London Symphony. I mean, the things like that happened to me and started me really thinking that you had to give back. It was a constant idea that if you were lucky and you made a decent career, then then you had a, uh, an obligation to give back. Well, that's so great that you did. It really panned out, I think. Uh, you've done such a great job of combining the classics and uh, more modern contemporary stuff. So, uh, and, and obviously that brings, it really broadens your audience. Oh, of course it does. I mean, we, with the National Academy Orchestra, we've given concerts regularly for the last 30 years uh, for high schools and for uh, junior schools, junior, middle, and high schools. And uh, at Hamilton Place, filling 10,000 seats with young people and uh, really doing some very interesting projects. And that brings Ardith back into the picture because she came up with a lot of original ideas 
uh, for these oh, yeah. and wrote stories. She's a, a children's author. Yeah, I wanted to mention that that Ardith, yeah. uh, I, I read I read about her bo- uh, her books. I, I mainly read the one called um, Here I Am. No. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, and she's working on a new one. Well, she's working on a on a on a, a, a quartet of books um, based upon a, a, a story, an adventure story. Uh, it's a tween book, um, and we're we're hoping that to get that published. And uh, uh, of course, it's a different world today. She <laughs> was her children's books were originally uh, published by Oxford University Press, which is a major uh, a major public public publisher. It was translated into French. Um, and uh, but it's very difficult to get a book published in Canada today. Well, wow. um, so it's it's we where we hope for the best because she certainly is a very creative person. Yeah, Ardith, I I love her just because I couldn't get your email address, and a friend uh, Sue Stilson gave me her email. And oh, is that how we got in that's touch? That's how it happened. Well, my so email address is really easy. It's just I my know, name. I, I should have tried that <laughs> first, but she immediately got a hold of you, and you immediately got back to me. So I was super impressed and quite happy about it. Um, just moving on to you know a little later in life, um, you started doing the Ontario Place uh, Pops concerts. Yes, and this yeah. is another thing that Ardith and I did together. Um, we both produced these concerts. Um, the Toronto Symphony could only do so n- so many concerts a summer, and uh, Ontario Place approached us. I can't remember who approached who. Uh, I think I may have approached them because the Philharmonic had a winter season but no summer season. And uh, I thought, what a ni- nice idea to... Ontario Place was such a, a marvelous place in, 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 as it was originally built in the round with a turntable stage yeah, the turn- that actually yeah. turned. And, and uh, it had about 3,500 seats under cover and then a further 10,000 seats on the hills that yeah, were sort of open. But they managed to ruin it. I mean, from my perspective, <laughs> they destroyed it and they put this other rock palace there. Not, not, a, uh, I don't, not that I dislike the rock aspect yeah, of it, but, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's sort of... Doesn't have the fantasy that old, the old Ontario place yeah, had. The, the old circular stage was pretty different. Was so we produced this series of concerts in an, in Toronto, um, usually about eight or nine concerts a year in the summers, and uh, pops concerts, sort of a la Arthur Fiedler, but with unusual ideas. You know, like doing a, a concerts with animals, with wild animals. Oh. Um, yes, we got all the um, animals from the the. Metro. So that no, no, no. Oh. They came from from the Hamilton area. Uh, there's that uh, African lion safari. African lion <laughs> safari, and I, I even trained a a, a a vulture whose name was Woodstock. I can still remember him very well. I had to go and 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 teach Woodstock to come to me on a glove. I had this glove, oh, yeah, and he not. weighed something like thirty thirty four. Pounds. I yeah. mean, it was really big. heavy when he, he landed on with his huge wingspan. He looked like a B-52 bomber coming at you. <laughs> yeah. And we did the Carnival of Animals of Saint-Saëns and, and various pieces, but all sort of in, influenced by animals. But the, again, the daring or the chutzpah, if I can call <laughs> it that, of you know putting live animals on a stage in Ontario Place. Wacky. It was crazy, and that but, was, but successful. And that was partly artist's idea? The oh, yes, thing? very much, oh, yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, she's unique. Now, the Ontario place uh, did that. Is that sort of what morphed into the Brat Music Festival? No, as I said earlier, I think it. Well, in a way, yes, uh, because we were used to doing things in the summer. summer, But it was Robert Morrow who who originally influenced us to come and fulfill those weekends when he had important guests here, and then we thought, well. When I left the Philharmonic, well, what is there that is missing in Hamilton? What, what, what can we do? Because we wanted to stay. We looked at other options. Ardith went to law school. It was a, very, a time of great uh, searching in our lives because Hamilton had been really the center of our lives. I, I had other positions in Europe. I was conductor of the BBC Orchestra of Wales and uh, the Northern Sinfonia and other orchestras and, and eventually um, built an orchestra in California called the New West Symphony, which is still functioning very healthily. Um, and uh, uh, But we, we decided that really we wanted to stay in Hamilton. Ardith uh, comes from, I think, sixth or seventh generation. Webster's Falls was originally her, her, 
family seat, if you will. Okay. Joseph Webster w- came, uh, I guess, about 200 years ago, maybe wow. more than that. Arthur, I, yeah. Arthur will be upset from, with me for not knowing the exact year, but he came but. here and developed a mill and uh, built the road from uh, the top of... Uh, like Highway 8 coming down yeah, Greensville. Yeah, coming down Greensville, now, what, Greensville, right. Greensville. Uh, into Dundas. He built that road. <laughs> and so she was really very much attached to the city. Her parents lived here. And um, so we thought, well, we're going to do something here. We'll start something here and see how it goes. Huh. And uh, I can do other things. Uh, Hamilton, uh, one of the marvelous things about Hamilton in a way is that it's, it's close to Toronto Transportation Hub. And Toronto... Really, there were flights from Toronto to just about everywhere without, you know, nonstop flights. And so I could do, about four summers ago, I um, uh, conducted an opera, Rigoletto, in, in Torre del Lago, which is uh, Puccini's birthplace. Okay. And uh, uh, the performances were on the weekend. And so I was able to be here during the week. And then on, yeah. on, on Thursday night, or actually Friday night, took a flight direct to to uh, London uh, during the day on Friday, overnighted in London, then flew to Pisa, was picked up in Pisa, uh, went to Torre del Lago, slept, gave a performance of the opera, and the next morning at 6 o'clock got up and went by train to the Rome and then right back right to back Hamilton. Home. Oh, so man. it was... <laughs> you a, could do things like that living in Hamilton. That was a, a long commute, boy, <laughs> on a weekly basis. But it was fun. I mean, and, and Hamilton is a wonderful city, a great city, wonderful people, and uh, it's a small town in certain ways, and yet a, a major metropolis in others. Yeah. And we've made a wonderful life for ourselves. Our children went to excellent schools, uh, um, and, and it's been a real home. Uh, often for conductors, I think they live a par- very peripatetic ex- existence where they're constantly traveling, um, and it's difficult to find a home. Yeah. Most of them end up in New York or London or Paris if they have international careers. Um, but being in Hamilton meant I could have a home, a house. Uh, our kids could go to school. We could live a normal life, have friends here in the city. And, and uh, it's as I said, it's a small town and a, a major metropolis at the same time. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. I'm never leaving it. Me neither. Um, yeah. So the Brant Music Festival, let's just chat about that, because uh, now you've had a number of rock or pop players with that as well, right? Yes. Well, um, as I, you know, we've, we've worked as we worked. Um, we wanted to be, yes, indeed. We wanted to be uh, unique and, and do things that were unusual. And the rock field d- did uh, provide us with... Uh, uh, an opportunity to do that, yeah, and uh, we were very much influenced, therefore, to uh, um, uh, to do. I can't really tell who that is in that okay, picture. Okay, Tara Lightfoot. Oh my God, yes, uh, yeah, that's and, right. And me and playing guitar and Tara playing, playing the violin. Guitar. What a riot! Well, I don't play the electric <laughs> guitar, and Tara does not play the violin either. But we <laughs> okay. had a lot of fun working together. No, uh, certainly the idea of combining music, classical music, and rock is is something that we've. Uh, we've adopted and we worked uh, very closely with the BR Expression Choirs. Um, they're an extraordinary outfit. Uh, the Tabones, uh, David and Mary Tabone, uh, this is out, out of Bishop Ryan High School. Bishop Ryan, uh, yeah. Okay. And, and, and they have a phenomenal chorus, which up until COVID um, yeah. were kind of the feature of our of our student programming, and so they they were their particular concentration was rock music and uh, nice. So and you've you've had a number like there's Tara. We've got another picture of that's uh, Tara on the far left, I believe, and um, looks like you've lost your position as conductor. Someone else, someone else. Well, is no, con- I've I've had an apprentice conductor. Okay, that's that. That's what's going working on. with me. I can't really. It's not it's very clear. It's a woman with long brown hair. Oh my goodness, um, I don't know who that is. I but, can't really uh, recognize it. Anyway, we've had apprentice conductors, like, you know, talking about teaching. I've had an apprentice uh, every year since we began the festival, and they now are resident conductors in many of the orchestras. Nice. Across Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you've been quite the mentor, I know. Um, so here's the Beatles. I know you've done an, a, a number of shows. Well, regrettably, I never met them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I w- was in England at the time they were kind of current, 
um, as assistant to Monteux. I sort of knew they existed. Yeah. Uh, but um, at that point, I wasn't doing anything like it. An extraordinary group of people. As a matter of fact, we were supposed to do a work by McCartney, um, a, an oratorio by McCartney in Montreal at the end of, of our season. And I'm also conductor of L'Orchestre Classique de Montréal, which is an orchestra my parents started 80 years ago oh, yeah. as the McGill Chamber Orchestra. We've just changed our name in the last two oh, years. Okay. But we were supposed to do this work, and I don't know whether we're going to get to do it because, again, it doesn't make sense if we can't have large audiences. And it's a choral piece, so the whole idea of choral singing still is uh, absolutely verboten, uh, certainly in North America. In Europe, it's sort of coming back. To what extent, I don't quite understand, because the virus is the virus. It's still there. Yeah. And, it's, and it's certainly, um, I understand, it's transmission from voice or, or wind or brass instrument is much, it's, it, it's much more virulent and it's easily transmitted. Um, and so I'm not exactly sure how they work. Uh, how it works, you have to have a distance of, I think, six feet at least hmm. between them. And as you mentioned earlier in our discussion, have plexiglass shields in front of them. Yes. So it's... Yeah, it's tricky. I don't... It's certainly tricky. So yeah. we probably... We've, we've actually postponed this for a year. But he was supposed to come and get a degree from the Université de Montréal, get a doctorate. Oh, yeah. And so I was looking forward to meeting him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't Here I'm going to miss my chance. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's postponed, let's put yeah, it that way. <laughs> postponed, okay. Now, we've also got uh, our Kells coming up here, which we uh, spoke yes, of earlier. Yes, that's the Junos. Yep, the Junos, that's right. I, I'd love to get them on the show sometime. Uh, well, can't... they're just around the corner here. You have to yeah, go around and visit them. But I can't seem to get a number or whatever, but we'll, we'll work just on go it. up to the house and knock on the door. Okay. Where's your chutzpah? <laughs> yeah, where's my chutzpah? <laughs> Oh, okay. And now we've got Star Max Wars. Max is very friendly, you know. I'm sure he'd be happy to, to meet you. Well, I've heard that, so maybe I'll do that. Just you knock should on do the that. store. I hope he's listening. Okay. Uh, here we are doing Star Wars. I see you, your dress is Darth Vader. Yes, wouldn't I be? And <laughs> <laughs> from the dark side. Okay, and lastly, the last photo I've got in this series is Hatchy the mouthpiece. Yes, I've done a number of programs with Hatchy. He, uh, we great guy. decided that uh, he would be great to do the percussion section uh, of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and <laughs> yeah. so um, we 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 did that, and he improvised that, and he was the kids absolutely loved him; they were fascinated by him. Oh, he's so and good! It's so unusual, you know, and yeah. such a lovely person. If you don't know Hatchy the mouthpiece, he. He does stuff with his mouth on a microphone. It's called it's beatboxing, I think. Beatboxing, yeah. yeah. It's like uh, all this drum sort of sounds done with his mouth. It's just phenomenal. Pretty amazing. Well, he had the whole audience doing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, all the kids. Are, and they, that, that's the one thing they remembered about this concert more than anything else. Oh, yeah. You know? Hatchy. So let's talk about your mentorship, because uh, I know you, you had some great mentors when you were young. Yes. And, and then... You, um, I think I've got, what have I got, a picture here? Oh, well, here's you being a mentor. Yes. Because obviously... That was with, I spent uh, oh, a number of years with the National Arts Centre Orchestra in Ottawa as the principal family and youth conductor for the orchestra. And this actually was in Chicago, um, if I remember correctly. And uh, we had a lot of young people playing in among the orchestra. Um, you know, young people are wonderful in the sense they... They give you a sense of youth, and I, I, I have a hard time confronting my real age. Um, you know, I look in the mirror and I see my father staring back, and I thought, well, yeah. man, that's when I, I'm glad that I'm myopic. You see, I can yeah, take my glasses off, too. and it all looks like a Renoir yeah. painting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like you've been photoshopped without Indeed. your glasses on. Indeed, but yeah. I feel young and vibrant, and I look that. I look at that picture. I know I don't look like that anymore, but. I well, feel like that. <laughs> well, good. I know what you mean, because I feel the same way. And that little girl sure looked happy. Uh, now, this is the National Academy Orchestra. That's right. That yes. we spoke of earlier, which is really like a huge mentoring program, right? It is a huge mentoring program and a very high quality. We uh, audition some 400 people every year and take 50. So it's Ooh. really a very selective process. And they're the finest young Canadian musicians from around the world who are in this position of 
of having finished their education and looking for employment and jobs. And uh, we, we tackle all kinds of subjects. We tackle the law and music and intellectual property, and we tackle in, injury avoidance and other subjects that are important. And uh, I've spent a lot of my, the last 27 years as a motivational speech speaker, yes. quite by accident, quite, <laughs> again, okay. I was guest conducting an orchestra in Dallas, and I'm used to talking to audiences. I started doing this before it became fashionable. And uh, vice president of IBM was in the audience and said, you know, would you, would you I've, I've gone to concerts my whole life, and the orchestra looks like such an ideal corporate model because you have a conductor who doesn't say anything. He just moves his arms around. You have leaders of sections, and everything's totally harmonious, no disagreement. Yeah. And I'd like you to do a, a module for a recognition event that we have uh, comparing the structure of an orchestra with the structure of IBM. Right. And so I said again, chutzpah, <laughs> said, sure, yeah, I'll sure. do that. I can do that. And uh, I did it in the end. And one of the things, characteristic things that I, I thought of, I, I didn't want to be a talking head. Yeah. And so I thought, well, how can I get the audience to perform, to have realize what it's like to play in an orchestra? And I came up with the idea of using uh, tone bars. Actually, it came from the or Carl Orff method that young kids study, Orff, yeah. where they have different instruments, and every time the teacher points to you, play on a rattle, or you play on, a, on, on one single note, or you play on a triangle, and so on. And he puts together pieces like this. And I thought, well, if we had the first five notes of a D major scale, D, E, F sharp, G, and A, we would have the basic notes that we require for the ode to joy. Um, so I thought, well, if I had sections of the audience, each with their own tone bars, I could conduct them like a carillon uh, with a live orchestra behind me. Huh. Anyway, we proposed that to IBM. They were delighted by it. And, and in the end, we didn't use a live orchestra, large, not because of the cost, but largely because it was difficult to get them on and off stage. And they needed things to re mm -hmm. move from move one quickly. thing to another quickly. Anyway, so they came up with the idea of putting on a triple screen and it, so I would appear to conduct an orchestra, which wasn't there at all. It was just ah. a video. And then a company conduct in real time the audience playing these tone bars. And that became the sort of central piece of this corporate lecture that I gave largely on, on the needs of the clients, of the corporation. Uh, I could, gave about 40 speeches a year to, to the likes of Microsoft and Intel and General Motors and General wow. Electric. So I, it, it, it really was the driver, the financial driver of my life oh, over yeah. the last 27 years, much more so than music. But huh. it, it, it allowed me to recognize that music as, and professional music as a, an ability, as a, a skill, is very highly prized by human resources of these larger companies. Hmm. And so, for example, if somebody turns up looking for a job at Intel or at uh, OpenText and they have a background as a professional musician, they go very high up into the list of, potential, of being potentially employed. Why? Because musicians, first of all, have a wonderful sense of self-discipline. You can't be a fine musician if you're not disciplined to work on your own. Also, you have an ability to work on a team. A teamwork, yeah. And that's also important. So those two elements, along with others, really having a personality where you work well together and that sort of thing, really uh, gives musicians a leg up, classical musicians a leg up in these other fields. And so since, I mean, we, we were producing as 50 musicians a year, well, there's no way the musical profession in Canada can absorb 50 classical musicians a year. You know, people have a principal oboe position, for example, and there are probably 10 orchestras in Canada where you can earn a living as a principal oboe player, yeah. when these guys are not willing to give up, or gals, yeah. are not willing to give up their jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it leads me really to this last year in covid uh, because in March, I realized there was no way we were getting these people together. We had auditioned players from coast to coast to coast. And uh, we were scared to bring them here to Hamilton because of the potential that they could be uh, harmed somewhere, catch the disease. My brother had been severely affected by the disease. He, he caught it early in March and was uh, on a ventilator for some 32 weeks and Whoa. barely escaped with his life. He's doing much better now. But I knew all of that, and so I thought, well, how can I make this a, a really special experience? So I thought, look, I have colleagues all over the world, 
I'm going to start calling people and say, would you give me a, a master class for these young people? And I have to say that, you know, from the concertmaster of the Berlin Philharmonic to the principal trombone of the Vienna Philharmonic, all of these people were pleased to say yes and to yeah. do it at a price we could afford to give them. So these young people in the National Academy have had the most incredible summer uh, being mentored by these marvelous musicians from all walks of life from all over the place. And soloists like Pinchas Zuckerman and Amanda Forsyth and... Um, uh, James Ennis and Stephen Isselis, all of these fabulous classical musicians whom I couldn't begin to afford to bring to Hamilton, uh, were able to teach online. Wow, that's pretty good, turning the COVID thing into a positive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Uh, just going back to the NAO for a sec, the, uh, the National Academy Orchestra, I think we have a clip, um, uh, uh, like a video. Is this it? Oh. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. However I do get a kick out of you. The National Academy Orchestra of Canada is perhaps the elite orchestral training program in this country. We give them aspects of training that they really didn't have at university, from things like intellectual property law, dealing with composition, what are your rights. The value that this provides is that it sets a very high and realistic standard of what it is to be in a professional orchestra. The pace that it goes at is very fast and you have to be on top of it right away and it really uh, sets you up for that world in that sense. I love these concerts, especially like tonight's concert, it's a Sinatra concert, so it's, it's much more fun, it's laid back, people are just having fun on stage and in the audience as well. One of the interesting things about the National Academy Orchestra is that you get to play a variety of styles and you're coached on these styles by um, some of the foremost professionals in Canada. Um, we did an opera this season and our concertmaster for the, the program was the concertmaster of the Canadian Opera Company Orchestra. Fifteen hundred young people have come through our program who have jobs all over the world in the last 32 years. The best part about this program is how well everybody works together. What we do is an, a hugely important part of the cultural fabric of Canada and, and, and everywhere indeed. And so I think it's a really great thing that what goes on here at the National Academy Orchestra. So there's a shot of the uh, National Academy Orchestra. That leads me to the broad opera, the pop opera, I think you called it. Um, which is kind of an emerging artist program? Yes, it's called very, Broad Opera, not broad. Pop Opera, but Sorry, we do a program within it called oh, Pop Opera. But <laughs> okay, I got confused. But. Um, well, Broad Opera is, again, something that we started, I guess, about seven years ago, and uh, it brings together young professionals um, who are emerging professionals in the operatic field. We audition in Toronto and New York and Montreal, and usually audition based on the needs of a production. So this last summer, again, was really interesting from that perspective because we were supposed to do Don Giovanni. And Don Giovanni, of course, is the story of Don Juan, yeah. basically this lecherous gentleman who uh, goes through life conquering women. Uh, not exactly uh, <laughs> a, a subject for today's audiences, uh, but rather, rather, uh, unfortunately, kind of misogynistic, if you will. Yeah. Uh, in any case, we... We had this program. Now, the program is normally uh, a three-week program, begins last week of June, and we have master classes with people like Adrian Piazonka and, uh, uh, you know, marvelous international stars who happen to be Canadian, uh, John Fanning uh, being another one. And uh, uh, then we do two programs with them, one which are popular opera excerpts, um, which is what is called pop opera, and then okay. we produce this opera. Now, we've done Carmen, and we've done Barbara Seville, and we've done uh, Magic Flute, and we've done a whole series of operas over these years. And this year, we were supposed to do Don Giovanni. But then, when it became obvious people couldn't come here, um, we decided to produce an opera virtually. 
And it really went extraordinarily well. I have a young director by the name of Anna Theodosakis, um, and uh, uh, she conceived of this opera really as the the uh, looking at it from the aspect of these young women who had been abused, uh, but rather looking at them as uh, survivors as opposed to victims. Okay, and. Uh, she uh, she joined all of these various uh, scenes of the opera by each of these women individually in black and white in extreme close up, writing their own story about their view of what Don Giovanni did to them and how they survived. Oh yeah. Uh, so it was interesting, and, and it was done kind of like Hollywood squares in the <laughs> sense because you had these various squares, literally of of scenes. Of, of from people's own living rooms, and she did some ingenious things, like at the end of the wedding, throwing the the, the bouquet of flowers, and it was thrown from the from the from the bottom square to the oh. person at the top square who caught it. Oh, yeah. You know, or or <laughs> the the last dinner where the where uh, Don Giovanni invites the uh, the statue of the gentleman of the of the nobleman whom he has murdered in the first scene to dinner, and uh, this is all on his way to ultimate judgment, ultimate vengeance of the Lord in the form of going to hell yeah. and burning in hell. Anyway, uh, there's this dinner and the plates are being passed from one screen to the next to various people <laughs> at the dinner. And this the last scene where the statue, this is always a problem in, in real opera because you have to take a, a statue, which is a, a physical thing, and bring it to life in the in the form of the commendatore, who comes to life. The statue actually comes to life. It's always a problem in real productions because how do you make a real statue come to life? Yeah. But with 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 video, you could do that easily because we superimposed the picture of of John Fanning, who was the the, the commendatore, and and gradually brought him into focus um, from that stone. Figure. Yeah, it's so it came to life. So it, it actually really came to life. Yeah, yeah. So there were all sorts of things that you could do that way uh, that you would have difficulty doing live. So we turned this whole thing actually into something quite unique. That's great. Is there somewhere we can still see? Oh, that? absolutely. There is somewhere, but you better go quickly because we're we're eventually going to turn this into a paying channel. Ah. At the moment, <laughs> if you go to www.brotmusic.com you can see all of these master classes and 17 brought music live interview programs and the opera all produced there free uh, we'll hope you'll make a donation in the process but but it's free for the moment but it we're, yeah. we're in the process of developing a channel um, and the last concert that we did just last weekend at Suan staff winery in Jordan uh, we uh, did Vivaldi's four seasons with a live orchestra, obviously socially distanced, wearing masks, and an audience, likewise socially distanced, in a tent. And this tent has a terrazzo floor. It's a large, large tent that'll accommodate 100 people at tables, again, with social distancing. Um, and it was really fabulous. We had the greatest day, and of course, all of this was videotaped. Uh, so eventually, this will be a production that we will we probably be the first production on that paying channel that we'll put forward in the next few weeks. Well, that's great. Brotmusic.com. Um, I think we're going to go for the close here. I just want to show one more clip. Um, we're going to sure. skip ahead there, Mark, a bit to the, uh, the one uh, Rock the Orchestra. Because uh, one of our great Hamilton um, spectator writers, Graham Rockingham, uh, he, he talks about that a little bit. Um, if you can find that, it's just uh, about a minute long. <clears throat> uh, I think well, that's the that opera. would be the that would be the next one, uh, Mark. You have Sorry, to go Mark. back one. Yeah, yeah, or uh, forward one. Forward one. Yeah, we're just skipping that as we're running out of time. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, Rock the Orchestra. I believe um, you did this uh, with Queen's song, um, We Will Rock You. Yes. And uh, the whole audience is, I think it was kids, right? Uh, yes, this is again part of our student concerts. That's right. And it's going to be a bit of a challenge this year, how we do it. Well, I'll just let, let it play. Okay.
standing on that stage, watching more than a thousand school-age children sing together, all from different schools, but singing together, we are the champions. It's one of the highlights uh, of my life, frankly. It's just, it was so warming, so inspiring to see what you can do uh, to introduce children of that age to music. I liked how they showed how things like different types of music evolved into like, to different like generations of music. There's so many types of classical music. I saw this music and then I found out there's a whole other world to classical music. Great I work. thought it was great how um, you had taken the classicals and then shown how they had been built into the like modern day hits and that allowed the students to relate to them. I thought it was really amazing how they incorporated I guess rock and roll with the classical instruments and the singing. It was fantastic. I like the violin because it's in the string family. I like the Daphne song and our national anthem. I liked it her costume. Well, it's colorful. Liked how all the different scenery and all the different instruments. The coach all right. It well, was Hatchy. Yeah, there was a little bit of Hatchy right there yes. at the end. But uh, speaking of the end, we're getting close to it. So uh, I got to say one, a couple of other things. You are now a member of the Order of Canada. Yes. That's big. And that's since, uh, whoa, since 2000. And when was that? 06 or something. Uh, I, well, Jean, Jean Sauvé was the Governor General. That okay. I, can tell you. <laughs> right. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah, well... I got to say, that's, um, I don't think we'll ever have another Order of Canada guy on the stage here, so I'm proud to have you well, here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud of it. It's a wonderful cer ceremony. It's, it really gives you a, a sense of the great accomplishment of Canadians, you know, in all fields. Yeah. It's amazing. And you know what I love about you, Boris, is your chutzpah, as you say, but that you are, you like to jump into change, you know, like... Like, I think this COVID thing, you said, hey, here's an opportunity. We got to solve this. We're going to figure out a way. And you continue to bring music to the people through this this period. Um, and, you know, it was Charles... Every silver lining has a cloud. No, <laughs> okay. I got that the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to quote Darwin because he said, it's not the strongest species that survived, nor the most intelligent. It's the one most receptive to change. I suppose that's true. And that is very, very profound. You're good at that, I think. <laughs> it's made you a wonderful man uh, throughout your life. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank sure. you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. It's and a sure. pleasure to renew our acquaintance. Yes, after all those, I don't know, it's 50 years or something. 50 so. years, yes. Um, just a couple of uh, last-minute announcements before we go. I want to say thanks to our sponsors, Marie Phillips at Next Steps Planning and IPC Securities. Um, we've also got a new person on board sponsoring us, Judy Marcel's Real Estate. She's the greatest real estate agent in Canada, broker, I should say, in Canada, and one of my favorite people. So um, she's on board now. We've got Nathan Fleet on the camera. Uh, we've got um, Patrick Maillet doing the clear cable and getting us online, Dave Plant on sound. Um, Mark uh, Scola also doing the getting us out online. Um, and our theater staff, Neil and Dan. I also have a big announcement that we are, uh, Cable 14 is now starting to show some Hamilton musicians live at the Westdale. I think it's called uh, Live at the Westdale, right, Neil? Yep. yep, so you can watch that on Cable 14. I think it's on right about now. It was on at 8.30 tonight, and it's on throughout the next few months at various times. So uh, you can check that out. Next week, we've got Ian Thomas. Right after that, we got Rick Emmett of Triumph, and then a fantastic lineup in October. So thanks so much for joining us on Hamilton Originals. Thanks to Boris Brat, and we'll see you all later. Bye for now. <laughs>